Chapter 19. The Cage of the Wild Birds "'Why, Mr. Ivory, come right in,' said the voice at the table. There was a screen before me, stretching from the fireplace to keep off the draught from the door by which I had entered. It stood higher than my head, but there were cracks in it through which I could watch the room. I found a little table on which I could lean my back, for I was dropping with fatigue. Blenkiron sat at the writing-table, and in front of him were little rows of patience cards. Wood ashes still smouldered in the stove, and a lamp stood at his right elbow which lit up the two figures. The bookshelves and the cabinets were in twilight. "'I've been hoping to see you for quite a time.' Blenkiron was busy arranging the little heaps of cards, and his face was wreathed in hospitable smiles. I remember wondering why he should play the host to the true master of the house. Ivory stood erect before him. He was a rather splendid figure now that he had sloughed off all disguises, and was on the threshold of his triumph. Even through the fog in which my brain worked, it was forced upon me that here was a man born to play a big part. He had a jowl like a Roman king on a coin, and scornful eyes that were used to mastery. He was younger than me, confound him, and now he looked it. He kept his eyes on the speaker, while a little smile played round his mouth, a very ugly smile. "'So,' he said, "'we have caught the old crow, too. I had scarcely hoped for such good fortune, and to speak the truth I had not concerned myself much about you. But now we shall add you to the bag. And what a bag of vermin to lay out on the lawn!' He flung back his head and laughed. "'Mr. Ivory,' Blenkiron began, but was cut short. Drop that name. All that has passed, thank God. I am the Graf von Schwabing, an officer of the Imperial Guard. I am not the least of the weapons that Germany has used to break her enemies. You don't say, drawled Blenkiron, still fiddling with his patience cards. The man's moment had come, and he was minded not to miss a jot of his triumph. His figure seemed to expand, his eye kindled, his voice rang with pride. It was melodrama of the best kind, and he fairly rolled it round his tongue. I don't think I grudged at him, for I was fingering something in my pocket. He had won all right, but he wouldn't enjoy his victory long, for soon I would shoot him. I had my eye on the very spot above his right ear, where I meant to put my bullet. For I was very clear that to kill him was the only way to protect Mary. I feared the whole seventy millions of Germany less than this man. That was the single idea that remained firm against the immense fatigue that pressed down on me. "'I have little time to waste on you,' said he who had been called Ivory. "'But I will spare a moment to tell you a few truths. Your childish game never had a chance. I played with you in England, and I have played with you ever since. You have never made a move, but I have quietly counted it. Why, man, you gave me your confidence. The American, Mr. Dunn.' "'What about Clarence?' asked Blenkiron. His face seemed to study in pure bewilderment. I was that interesting journalist. "'Now, to think of that,' said Blenkiron, in a sad, gentle voice. "'I thought I was safe with Clarence. Why, he brought me a letter from old Joe Hooper, and he knew all the boys down Emporia way.' Ivory laughed. "'You have never done me justice, I fear, but I think you will do it now. Your gang is helpless in my hands.' General Hannay, and I wish I could give you a notion of the scorn with which he pronounced the word general. Yes, Dick, said Blenkiron intently. He has been my prisoner for twenty-four hours, and the pretty Miss Mary, too. You are all going with me in a little to my own country. You will not guess how. We call it the Underground Railway, and you will have the privilege of studying its working. I had not troubled much about you, for I had no special dislike of you. You are only a blundering fool, what you call in your country easy fruit. I thank you, Graf, Blenkiron said solemnly. But since you are here, you will join the others. One last word. To beat inept such as you is nothing. There is a far greater thing. My country has conquered. You and your friends will be dragged at the chariot wheels of a triumph such as Rome never saw. Does that penetrate your thick skull? Germany has won, and in two days the whole round earth will be stricken dumb by her greatness. 
As I watched Blenkiron, a grey shadow of hopelessness seemed to settle on his face. His big body drooped in his chair, his eyes fell, and his left hand shuffled limply among his patient's cards. I could not get my mind to work, but I puzzled miserably over his amazing blunders. He had walked blindly into the pit his enemies had dug for him. Peter must have failed to get my message to him, and he knew nothing of last night's work or my mad journey to Italy. We had all bungled, the whole wretched bunch of us, Peter and Blenkiron and myself. I had a feeling at the back of my head that there was something in it all I couldn't understand, that the catastrophe could not be quite as simple as it seemed. But I had no power to think, with the insolent figure of ivory dominating the room. Thank God I had a bullet waiting for him! That was the one fixed point in the chaos of my mind. For the first time in my life I was resolute on killing one particular man, and the purpose gave me a horrid comfort. Suddenly Ivory's voice rang out sharp. "'Take your hand out of your pocket. You fool, you are covered from three points in the walls. A movement, and my men will make a sieve of you. Others before you have sat in that chair, and I am used to take precautions. Quick, both hands on the table.' There was no mistake about Blenkiron's defeat. He was done and out, and I was left with the only card. He leaned wearily on his arms, with his palms of his hands spread out. "'I reckon you've got a strong hand, Graf,' he said, and his voice was flat with despair. "'I hold a royal flush,' was the answer. And then suddenly came a change. Blenkiron raised his head, and his sleepy, ruminating eyes looked straight at Ivory. "'I call you,' he said. I didn't believe my ears, nor did Ivory. "'The hour for bluff is past,' he said. "'Nevertheless, I call you.' At that moment I felt someone squeeze through the door behind me, and take his place at my side. The light was so dim that I saw only a short square figure, but a familiar voice whispered in my ear, "'It's me, Andra Amos. Man, this is a great ploy. I'm here to see the end of it. No prisoner waiting on the finding of the jury, no commander expecting news of a great battle, ever hung in more desperate suspense than I did during the next seconds. I had forgotten my fatigue. My back no longer needed support. I kept my eyes glued to the crack in the screen, and my ears drank in greedily every syllable. Blenkiron was now sitting bolt upright with his chin in his hands. There was no shadow of melancholy in his lean face. I say, I call you Herr Graf von Schwabing. I'm going to put you wise about some little things. You don't carry arms, so I needn't warn you against monkeying with a gun. You're right in saying that there are three places in these walls from which you can shoot. Well, for your information, I may tell you that there's guns in all three, but they're covering you at this moment, so you'd better be good. Ivory sprang to attention like a ramrod. Karl, he cried, Gustav! As if by magic, figures stood on either side of him, like warders by a criminal. They were not the sleek German footmen whom I had seen at the chalet. One I did not recognize. The other was my servant, Geordie Hamilton. He gave them one glance, looked round like a hunted animal, and then steadied himself. The man had his own kind of courage. "'I've gotten something to say to you,' Blenkiron drawled. It's been a tough fight, but I reckon the hot end of the poker is with you. I compliment you on Clarence Dunn. You fooled me fine over that business, and it was only by the mercy of God you didn't win out. You see, there was just the one of us who was liable to recognize you, whatever way you twisted your face, and that was Dick Hannay. I give you good marks for Clarence. For the rest, I had you beaten flat. He looked steadily at him. You don't believe it? Well, I'll give you proof. I've been watching your underground railway for quite a time. I've had my men on the job, and I reckon most of the lines are now closed for repairs. All but the trunk line into France. That I'm keeping open, for soon there's going to be some traffic on it." At that I saw Ivory's eyelids quiver. For all his self-command, he was breaking. I admit we cut it mighty fine, along of your fooling me about Clarence. But you struck a bad snag in General Hannay, Graf. Your heart-to-heart -heart talk with him was poor business. 
You reckoned you had him safe, but that was too big a risk to take with a man like Dick, unless you saw him cold before you left him. He got away from this place, and early this morning I knew all he knew. After that it was easy. I got the telegram you had sent this morning, in the name of Clarence Dunn, and it made me laugh. Before midday I had this whole outfit under my hand. Your servants have gone by the underground railway to France. Ehrlich? Well, I'm sorry about Ehrlich. I knew now the name of the Portuguese Jew. He wasn't a bad sort of man, Blenkiron said regretfully, and he was plumb honest. I couldn't get him to listen to reason, and he would play with firearms. So I had to shoot. Dead? asked Ivory sharply. Yes. I don't miss, and it was him or me. He's under the ice now, where you wanted to send Dick Hannay. He wasn't your kind, Graf, and I guess he has some chance of getting into heaven. If I weren't a hard-shell Presbyterian, I'd say a prayer for his soul." I looked only at Ivory. His face had gone very pale, and his eyes were wandering. I am certain his brain was working at lightning speed, but he was a rat in a steel trap, and the springs held him. If ever I saw a man going through hell, it was now. His pasteboard castle had crumbled about his ears, and he was giddy with the fall of it. The man was made of pride, and every proud nerve of him was caught on the raw. "'So much for ordinary business,' said Blenkiron. "'There's the matter of a certain lady. You haven't behaved over nice about her, Graf, but I'm not going to blame you. You maybe heard a whistle blow when you were coming in here? No? Why, it sounded like Gabriel's trump. Peter must have put some lung power into it. Well, that was the signal that Miss Mary was safe in your car, but in our charge. Do you comprehend?" He did. The ghost of a flush appeared in his cheeks. "'You ask about General Hannay? I'm not just exactly sure where Dick is at the moment, but I opine he's in Italy.' I kicked aside the screen, thereby causing Amos almost to fall on his face. "'I'm back,' I said and pulled up an armchair and dropped into it. I think the sight of me was the last straw for Ivory. I was a wild enough figure, grey with weariness, soaked, dirty, with the clothes of the porter Josef Zimmer in rags from the sharp rocks of the Schwarzstein Tor. As his eyes caught mine they wavered, and I saw terror in them. He knew he was in the presence of a mortal enemy. "'Why, Dick!' said Blenkiron, with a beaming face. This is mighty opportune. How in creation did you get here?" I walked, I said. I did not want to have to speak, for I was too tired. I wanted to watch Ivory's face. Blenkiron gathered up his patience cards, slipped them into a little leather case, and put it in his pocket. I've one thing more to tell you. The wild birds have been summoned home, but they won't ever make it. We've gathered them in. Pavia, and Hofgaard, and Conradi, Ehrlich is dead, and you are going to join the rest in our cage." As I looked at my friend, his figure seemed to gain in presence. He sat square in his chair, with a face like a hanging judge, and his eyes, sleepy no more, held ivory as in a vice. He had dropped, too, his drawl and the idioms of his ordinary speech and his voice came out hard and massive, like the clash of granite blocks. "'You're at the bar now, Graf von Schwabing. For years you've done your best against the decencies of life. You have deserved well of your country, I don't doubt it. But what has your country deserved of the world? One day soon Germany has to do some heavy paying, and you are the first instalment.' I appeal to the Swiss law. I stand on Swiss soil, and I demand that I be surrendered to the Swiss authorities." Ivory spoke with dry lips, and the sweat was on his brow. "'Oh, no, no,' said Blenkiron soothingly. "'The Swiss are a nice people, and I would hate to add to the worries of a poor little neutral state. All along both sides have been outside the law in this game, and that's going to continue. We've abode by the rules, and so must you. For years you've murdered and kidnapped and seduced the weak and ignorant, but we're not going to judge your morals. We leave that to the Almighty when you get across Jordan. We're going to wash our hands of you as soon as we can. You'll travel to France by the Underground Railway, and there be handed over to the French government. 
For what I know, they've enough against you to shoot you every hour of the day for a twelvemonth. I think he had expected to be condemned by us there and then, and sent to join Ehrlich beneath the ice. Anyhow, there came a flicker of hope into his eyes. I dare say he saw some way to dodge the French authorities, if he once got a chance to use his miraculous wits. Anyhow, he bowed with something very much like self-possession, and asked permission to smoke. As I have said, the man had his own courage. Blenkiron, I cried, we're going to do nothing of the kind. He inclined his head gravely toward me. What's your notion, Dick? We've got to make the punishment fit the crime, I said. I was so tired that I had to form my sentences laboriously, as if I were speaking a half-understood foreign tongue. Meaning? I mean that if you hand him over to the French, he'll either twist out of their hands somehow, or get decently shot, which is far too good for him. This man and his kind have sent millions of honest folk to their graves. He has sat spinning his web like a great spider, and for every thread there has been an ocean of blood spilled. It's his sort that made the war, not the brave, stupid, fighting Bosch. It's his sort that's responsible for all the clotted beastliness, and he's never been in sight of a shell. I'm for putting him in the front line. No, I don't mean any Uriah the Hittite business. I want him to have a sporting chance, just what other men have. But by God, he's going to learn what is the upshot of the strings he's been pulling so merrily. He told me in two days' time Germany would smash our armies to hell. He boasted that he would be mostly responsible for it. Well, let him be there to see the smashing. I reckon that's just, said Blenkiron. Ivory's eyes were on me now, fascinated and terrified, like those of a bird before a rattlesnake. I saw again the shapeless features of the man in the tube station, the residuum of shrinking mortality behind his disguises. He seemed to be slipping something from his pocket towards his mouth, but Geordie Hamilton caught his wrist. "'What you offer?' said the scandalized voice of my servant. "'Sir, the prisoner would appear to be trying to poison himself. Will I search him?' After that he stood with each arm in the grip of a warder. "'Mr. Ivory,' I said, "'last night, when I was in your power, you indulged your vanity by gloating over me. I expected it, for your class does not breed gentlemen. We treat our prisoners differently, but it is fair that you should know your fate. You are going into France, and I will see that you are taken to the British front. There, with my old division, you will learn something of the meaning of war.' Understand that by no conceivable chance can you escape. Men will be detailed to watch you day and night, to see that you undergo the full rigour of the battlefield. You will have the same experience as other people, no more, no less. I believe in a righteous God, and I know that sooner or later you will find death, death at the hands of your own people, an honourable death which is far beyond your deserts. But before it comes, you will have understood the hell to which you have condemned honest men. In moments of great fatigue, as in moments of great crisis, the mind takes charge and may run on a track independent of the will. It was not myself that spoke, but an impersonal voice which I did not know, a voice in whose tones rang a strange authority. Ivory recognized the icy finality of it, and his body seemed to wilt and droop. Only the hold of the warders kept him from falling. I, too, was about at the end of my endurance. I felt dimly that the room had emptied, except for Blenkiron and Amos, and that the former was trying to make me drink brandy from the cup of a flask. I struggled to my feet with the intention of going to Mary, but my legs would not carry me. I heard, as in a dream, Amos giving thanks to an omnipotence in whom he officially disbelieved. What's that old man in the Bible said? Now let thou thy servant depart at peace. That's the way I'm feelin' myself. And then slumber came on me like an armed man, and in the chair by the dying wood-ash I slept off the ache of my limbs, the tension of my nerves, and the confusion of my brain. CHAPTER Twenty: THE STORM BREAKS IN THE WEST The following evening, it was the twentieth day of March, I started for France after the dark fell. I drove Ivory's big closed car, and within sat its owner, bound and gagged, 
as others had sat before him on the same errand. Geordie Hamilton and Amos were his companions. For what Blenkiron had himself discovered from the papers seized in the pink chalet, I had full details of the road and its mysterious stages. It was like the journey of a mad dream. In a back street of a little town, I would exchange passwords with a nameless figure and be given instructions. At a wayside inn, at an appointed hour, a voice speaking in a thick German would advise me that this bridge or that railway crossing had been cleared. At a hamlet among pine woods an unknown man would clamber up beside me and take me past a sentry post. Smooth as clockwork was the machine, till in the dawn of a spring morning I found myself dropping into a broad valley, through little orchards just beginning to blossom, and I knew that I was in France. After that Blenkiron's own arrangements began, and soon I was drinking coffee with a young lieutenant of chasseurs, and had taken the gag from Ivory's mouth. The blue coats looked curiously at the man in the green ulster, whose face was the colour of clay, and who lit cigarette from cigarette with a shaky hand. The lieutenant rang up a general of division who knew all about us. At his headquarters I explained my purpose, and he telegraphed to an army headquarters for a permission which was granted. It was not for nothing that in January I had seen certain great personages in Paris, and that Blenkiron had wired ahead of me to prepare the way. Here I handed over Ivory and his guard, for I wanted them to proceed to Amiens under French supervision, well knowing that the men of that great army are not used to let slip what they once hold. It was a morning of clear spring sunlight, when we breakfasted in that little red-roofed town, among vineyards with a shining river looping at our feet. The general of division was an Algerian veteran with a brush of grizzled hair, whose eye kept wandering to a map on the wall where pins and stretched thread made a spider's web. "'Any news from the north?' I asked. "'Not yet,' he said, "'but the attack comes soon. It will be against our army in Champagne.' With a lean figure he pointed out the enemy dispositions. "'Why not against the British?' I asked. With a knife and fork I made a right angle and put a salt dish in the centre. That is the German concentration. They can so mass that we do not know which side of the angle they will strike till the blow falls. It is true, he replied, but consider, for the enemy to attack towards the Somme would be to fight over many miles of an old battleground where all is still desert and every yard of which you British know. In Champagne, at a bound, he might enter unbroken country. It is a long and difficult road to Amiens, but not so long to Chilon. Such is the view of Pétain. Does it convince you? The reasoning is good. Nevertheless, he will strike at Amiens, and I think he will begin to-day. He laughed and shrugged his shoulders. Nous verrons. You are obstinate, my general, like all your excellent countrymen. But as I left his headquarters, an aide-de-camp handed him a message on a pink slip. He read it, and turned to me with a grave face. "'You have a flair, my friend. I am glad we did not wager. This morning at dawn there is great fighting around Saint-Quentin. Be comforted, for they will not pass. Your maréchal will hold them.' That was the first news I had of the battle. At Dijon, according to plan, I met the others. I only just caught the Paris train, and Blenkiron's great wrists lugged me into the carriage when it was well in motion. There sat Peter, a docile figure in a carefully patched old RFC uniform. Wake was reading a pile of French papers, and in a corner Mary, with her feet up on the seat, was sound asleep. We did not talk much, for the life of the past days had been so hectic that we had no wish to recall it. Blenkiron's face wore an air of satisfaction, and as he looked out at the sunny spring landscape, he hummed his only tune. Even Wake had lost his restlessness. He had on a pair of big tortoiseshell reading glasses, and when he looked up from his newspaper and caught my eye, he smiled. Mary slept like a child, delicately flushed, her breath scarcely stirring the collar of the greatcoat which was folded across her throat. I remember looking with a kind of awe at the curve of her young face, and the long lashes that lay so softly on her cheek, and wondering how I had borne the anxiety of the last months. Wake raised his head from his reading, 
glanced at Mary, and then at me, and his eyes were kind, almost affectionate. He seemed to have won peace of mind among the hills. Only Peter was out of the picture. He was a strange, disconsolate figure, as he shifted about to ease his leg, or gazed incuriously from the window. He had shaved his beard again, but it did not make him younger, for his face was too lined, and his eyes too old to change. When I spoke to him, he looked towards Mary, and held up a warning finger. "'I go back to England,' he whispered. "'Your little Misi is going to take care of me till I am settled. We spoke of it yesterday at my cottage. I will find a lodging, and be patient till the war is over. And you, Dick?' "'Oh, I rejoined my division. Thank God this job is over. I have an easy mind now, and can turn my attention to straightforward soldiering.' I don't mind telling you that I'll be glad to think that you and Mary and Blenkiron are safe at home. What about you, Wake? I go back to my labour battalion, he said cheerfully. Like you, I have an easier mind. I shook my head. We'll see about that. I don't like such sinful waste. We've had a bit of campaigning together, and I know your quality. The battalion's quite good enough for me, and he relapsed into a day-old ton. Mary had suddenly woke, and was sitting upright with her fist in her eyes like a small child. Her hand flew to her hair, and her eyes ran over us, as if to see that we were all there. As she counted the four of us, she seemed relieved. "'I reckon you feel refreshed, Miss Mary,' said Blenkiron. "'It's good to think that now we can sleep in peace, all of us. Pretty soon you'll be in England, and spring will be beginning, and please God it'll be the start of a better world.' Our work's over, anyhow. I wonder, said the girl gravely. I don't think there's any discharge in this war. Dick, have you news of the battle? This was the day. It's begun, I said, and I told him the little I had learned from the French general. I've made a reputation as a prophet, for he thought the attack was coming in Champagne. It's Saint-Quentin, right enough, but I don't know what has happened. We'll hear in Paris. Mary had woke with a startled air, as if she remembered her old instinct that our work would not be finished without a sacrifice, and that sacrifice the best of us. The notion kept recurring to me with an uneasy insistence. But soon she appeared to forget her anxiety. That afternoon, as we journeyed through the pleasant land of France, she was in holiday mood, and she forced all our spirits up to her level. It was calm, bright weather. The long curves of plough-land were beginning to quicken into green, the catkins made a blue mist on the willows by the watercourses, and in the orchards by the red-roofed hamlets the blossom was breaking. In such a scene it was hard to keep the mind sober and grey, and the pall of war slid from us. Mary cosseted and fussed over Peter like an elder sister over a delicate little boy. She made him stretch his bad leg full length on the seat, and when she made tea for the party of us, it was a protesting Peter who had the last sugar biscuit. Indeed, we were almost a merry company, for Blenkiron told stories of old hunting and engineering days in the West, and Peter and I were driven to cap them, and Mary asked provocative questions, and Wake listened with amused interest. It was well that we had the carriage to ourselves, for no queerer rigs were ever assembled. Mary, as always, was neat and workmanlike in her dress. Blenkiron was magnificent, in a suit of russet tweed, with a pale blue shirt and collar, and well-polished brown shoes. But Peter and Wake were in uniforms which had seen far better days, and I wore still the boots and the shapeless and ragged clothes of Josef Zimmer, the porter from Arosa. We appeared to forget the war, but we didn't, for it was in the background of all our minds. Somewhere in the north there was raging a desperate fight, and its issue was the true test of our success or failure. Mary showed it by bidding me ask for news at every stopping place. I asked gendarmes and permissionnaires, but I learned nothing. Nobody had ever heard of the battle. The upshot was that for the last hour we all fell silent, and when we reached Paris about seven o'clock, my first errand was to the bookstall. I bought a batch of evening papers which we tried to read in the taxis that carried us to our hotel. Sure enough, there was the announcement in big headlines. The enemy had attacked in great strength from south of Arras to the Oise, but everywhere he had been repulsed and held in our battle zone. The leading articles were confident, the notes by the various military critics were almost braggart. 
At last the German had been driven to an offensive, and the Allies would have the opportunity they had longed for of proving their superior fighting strength. It was, said one and all, the opening of the last phase of the war. I confess that as I read, my heart sank. If the civilians were so overconfident, might not the generals have fallen into the same trap? Blenkiron alone was unperturbed. Mary said nothing, but she sat with her chin in her hands, which with her was a sure sign of deep preoccupation. Next morning the papers could tell us little more. The main attack had been on both sides of Saint-Quentin, and though the British had given ground it was only the outpost's line that had gone. The mist had favoured the enemy, and his bombardment had been terrific, especially the gas shells. Every journal added the old, old comment that he had paid heavily for his temerity, with losses far exceeding those of the defence. Wake appeared at breakfast in his private's uniform. He wanted to get his railway warrant, and be off at once, but when I heard that Amiens was his destination, I ordered him to stay and travel with me in the afternoon. I was in uniform myself now, and had taken charge of the outfit. I arranged that Blenkiron, Mary, and Peter should go on to Boulogne and sleep the night there, while Wake and I would be dropped at Amiens to await instructions. I spent a busy morning. Once again I visited with Blenkiron the little cabinet in the boulevard Saint-Germain, and told in every detail our work of the past two months. Once again I sat in the low building beside the Invalides, and talked to staff officers. But some of the men I had seen on the first visit were not there. The chiefs of the French army had gone north. We arranged for the handling of the wild birds, now safely in France, and sanction was given to the course I had proposed to adopt with Ivory. He and his guard were on their way to Amiens, and I would meet them there on the morrow. The great men were very complimentary to us, so complimentary that my knowledge of grammatical French ebbed away, and I could only stutter in reply. That telegram sent by Blenkiron on the night of the 18th, from the information given me in the pink chalet, had done wonders in clearing up the situation. But when I asked them about the battle, they could tell me little. It was a very serious attack in tremendous force, but the British line was strong, and the reserves were believed to be sufficient. Pétain and Foch had gone north to consult with Haig. The situation in Champagne was still obscure, but some French reserves were already moving thence to the Somme sector. One thing they did show me, the British dispositions. As I looked at the plan, I saw that my old division was in the thick of the fighting. "'Where do you go now?' I was asked. "'To Amiens, and then, please God, to the battlefront,' I said. "'Good fortune to you. You do not give body or mind much rest, my general.' After that I went to the Mission Anglaise, but they had nothing beyond Haig's communique, and a telephone message from G.H.Q. that the critical sector was likely to be that between Saint-Quentin and the Oise. The northern pillar of our defence, south of Arras, which they had been nervous about, had stood like a rock. That pleased me, for my old battalion of the Lennox Highlanders was there. Crossing the Place de la Concorde, we fell in with a British staff officer of my acquaintance, who was just starting to motor back to G.H.Q. from Paris leave. He had a longer face than the people at the Invalide. "'I don't like it, I tell you,' he said. "'It's this mist that worries me. I went down the whole line from Arras to the Oise ten days ago. It was beautifully sighted, the cleverest thing you ever saw. The outpost line was mostly a chain of blobs, redoubts, you know, with machine-guns, so arranged as to bring flanking fire to bear on the advancing enemy. But mist would play the devil with that scheme, for the enemy would be past the place for flanking fire before we knew it. Oh, I know we had good warning, and had the battle zone manned in time, but the outpost line was meant to hold out long enough to get everything behind in apple-pie order, and I can't see but how big chunks of it must have gone in the first rush. Mind you, we've banked everything on that battle zone. It's damned good, but if it's gone—' He flung up his hands. "'Have we good reserves?' I asked. He shrugged his shoulders. "'Have we positions prepared behind the battle zone?' "'I didn't notice any,' he said dryly, and was off before I could get more out of him. "'You look rattled, Dick,' said Blenkiron, as we walked to the hotel. "'I seem to have got the needle. It's silly. 
but I feel worse about this show than I've ever felt since the war started. Look at this city here. The papers take it easily, and the people are walking about as if nothing was happening. Even the soldiers aren't worried. You may call me a fool to take it so hard, but I have a sense in my bones that we're in for the bloodiest and darkest fight of our lives, and that soon Paris will be hearing the Bosch guns as she did in 1914. You're a cheerful old Jeremiah. Well, I'm glad Miss Mary's going to be in England soon. Seems to me she's right, and that this game of ours isn't quite played out yet. I'm envying you some, for there's a place waiting for you in the fighting line. You've got to get home and keep people's heads straight there. That's the weak link in our chain, and there's a mighty lot of work before you. Maybe, he said abstractedly, with his eye on the top of the Vendôme column. The train that afternoon was packed with officers recalled from leave, and it took all the combined purchase of Blenkiron and myself to get a carriage reserved for our little party. At the last moment I opened the door to admit a warm and agitating captain of the RFC, in whom I recognized my friend and benefactor, Archie Roylance. Just when I was getting nice and clean and comfy, a wire comes telling me to bundle back all along of a new battle. It's a cruel war, sir. The afflicted young man mopped his forehead, grinned cheerfully at Blenkiron, glanced critically at Peter, then caught sight of Mary, and grew at once acutely conscious of his appearance. He smoothed his hair, adjusted his tie, and became desperately sedate. I introduced him to Peter, and he promptly forgot Mary's existence. If Peter had had any vanity in him, it would have been flattered by the frank interest and admiration in the boy's eyes. "'I'm tremendously glad to see you safe back, sir. I've always hoped I might get a chance of meeting you. We want you badly now on the front. Lynch is getting a bit uppish.' Then his eye fell on Peter's withered leg, and he saw that he had blundered. He blushed scarlet and looked his apologies. But they weren't needed, for it cheered Peter to meet someone who talked of the possibility of his fighting again. Soon the two were deep in technicalities, the appalling technicalities of the airmen. It was no good listening to their talk, for you could make nothing of it, but it was bracing up Peter like wine. Archie gave him a minute description of Lynch's latest doings and his new methods. He, too, had heard the rumour that Peter had mentioned to me at San Anton, of a new Bosch plane, with mighty engines and stumpy wings, cunningly cambered, which was a devil to climb, but no specimens had yet appeared over the line. They talked of Bali and Rice Davids and Bishop and McCudden, and all the heroes who had won their spurs since the Somme, and of the new British makes, most of which Peter had never seen and had to have explained to him. Outside a haze had drawn over the meadows with the twilight. I pointed it out to Blenkiron. "'There's the fog that's doing us. This March weather is just like October. Mist morning and evening. I wish to heaven we could have some good old drenching spring rain.' Archie was discoursing on the shark Gladys machine. "'I've always stuck to it, for it's a marvel in its way, but it has my heart fairly broke. The general here knows its little tricks, don't you, sir? Whenever things get really exciting, the engines have to quit work and take a rest.' The whole make should be publicly burned, I said, with gloomy recollections. I wouldn't go so far, sir. The old Gladys has surprising merits. On her day there's nothing like her for pace and climbing power, and she steers as sweet as a racing cutter. The trouble about her is she's too complicated. She's like some breeds of car. You want to be a mechanical genius to understand her. If they'd only get her a little simpler and safer, there wouldn't be her match in the field. I'm about the only man that has patience with her and knows her merits, but she's often been nearly the death of me. All the same, if I were in for a big fight against some fellow like Lynch, where it was neck or nothing, I'm hanged if I wouldn't pick the Gladys. Archie laughed apologetically. The subject is banned for me in our mess. I'm the old thing's only champion, and she's like a mare I used to hunt that loved me so much she was always trying to chew the arm off me. But I wish I could get her a fair trial from one of the big pilots. I'm only in the second class myself. We were running north of Saint-Just, when above the rattle of the train rose a curious dull sound. It came from the east and was like the low growl of a veld thunderstorm or a steady roll of muffled drums. 
Hark to the guns, cried Archie. My aunt, there's a tidy bombardment going on somewhere. I had been listening on and off to guns for three years. I had been present at the big preparations before Luce and the Somme and Arras, and I had come to accept the racket of artillery as something natural and inevitable, like rain or sunshine. But this sound chilled me with its eeriness. I don't know why. Perhaps it was its unexpectedness, for I was sure that the guns had not been heard in this area since before the Marne. The noise must be travelling down the Oise Valley, and I judged there was big fighting somewhere about Chauny or La Fere. That meant that the enemy was pressing hard on a huge front, for here was clearly a great effort on its extreme left wing, unless it was our counter-attack, but somehow I didn't think so. I let down the window and stuck my head into the night. The fog had crept up to the edge of the track, a gossamer mist through which houses and trees and cattle could be seen dim in the moonlight. The noise continued, not a mutter, but a steady rumbling flow as solid as the blare of a trumpet. Presently, as we drew nearer Amiens, we left it behind us, for in all the Somme Valley there was some curious configuration which blankets sound. The country folk call it the silent land, and during the first phase of the Somme battle a man in Amiens could not hear the guns twenty miles off at Albert. As I sat down again, I found that the company had fallen silent, even the garrulous Archie. Mary's eyes met mine, and in the indifferent light of the French railway carriage I could see excitement in them. I knew it was excitement, not fear. She had never heard the noise of a great barrage before. Blenkiron was restless, and Peter was sunk in his own thoughts. I was growing very depressed, for in a little I would have to part from my best friends and the girl I loved. But with the depression was mixed an odd expectation, which was almost pleasant. The guns had brought back my profession to me. I was moving towards their thunder, and God only knew the end of it. The happy dream I had dreamed of in the Cotswolds, and a home with Mary beside me, seemed suddenly to have fallen away to an infinite distance. I felt once again that I was on the razor edge of life. The last part of the journey I was casting back to rake up my knowledge of the countryside. I saw again the stricken belt from Serre to Comble, where we had fought in the summer of seventeen. I had not been present in the advance of the following spring, but I had been at Combray, and I knew all the down country from Lagnicourt to Saint-Quentin. I shut my eyes and tried to picture it, and to see the roads running up to the line, and wondered just at what points the big pressure had come. They had told me in Paris that the British were as far south as the Oise, so the bombardment we had heard must be directed to our address. With Passchendaele and Combray in my mind, and with some notion of the difficulty we always had in getting drafts, I was puzzled to think where we could have found the troops to man the new front. We must be unholily thin on that long line, and against that awesome bombardment, and the masses and the new tactics that Ivory had bragged of. When we ran into the dingy cavern, which is Amiens station, I seemed to note a new excitement. I felt it in the air rather than deduced it from any special incident, except that the platform was very crowded with civilians, most of them with an extra amount of baggage. I wondered if the place had been bombed the night before. "'We won't say good-bye yet,' I told the others. "'The train doesn't leave for half an hour. I'm off to try and get news.' Accompanied by Archie, I hunted out an RTO of my acquaintance. To my questions he responded cheerfully. "'Oh, we're doing famously, sir. I heard this afternoon from a man in operations that GHQ was perfectly satisfied. We've killed a lot of Huns and lost only a few kilometres of ground. You're going to your division? Well, it's up Perron way, or was last night. Chain and Dunthorpe came back from leave and tried to steal a car to get up to it. Oh, I'm having a deuce of a time. These blighted civilians have got the wind up, and a lot are trying to clear out. The idiots say the Huns will be in Amiens in a week. What's the phrase? Pourvu que les civils tiennent. Afraid I must push on, sir. I sent Archie back with these scraps of news, and was about to make a rush for the house of one of the press officers, who would, I thought, be in the way of knowing things, when at the station entrance I ran across Laidlaw. He had been BGGS in the corps to which my old brigade belonged, and was now on the staff of some army. 
He was striding towards the car when I grabbed his arm, and he turned on me a very sick face. "'Good Lord, Hannay, where did you spring from? The news, you say?' He sank his voice and drew me into a quiet corner. "'The news is hellish.' "'They told me we were holding,' I observed. "'Holding be damned. The Boche is clean through on a broad front. He broke us today at Messumi and Essigny. Yes, the battle zone. He's flinging in division after division like the blows of a hammer. What else could you expect?' And he clutched my arm fiercely. How in God's name could eleven divisions hold a front of forty miles? And against four to one in numbers? It isn't war, it's naked lunacy. I knew the worst now, and it didn't shock me, for I had known it was coming. Laidlaw's nerves were pretty bad, for his face was pale, and his eyes bright like a man with a fever. Reserves! And he laughed bitterly. We have three infantry divisions and two cavalry. They're into the mill long ago. The French are coming up on our right, but they've the devil of a way to go. That's what I'm down here about, and we're getting help from Horn and Plummer. But all that takes days, and meantime we're walking back like we did at Mons. And at this time of day, too, oh, yes, the whole line's retreating. Parts of it were pretty comfortable, but they had to get back or be put in the bag. I wish to heaven I knew where our right divisions have got to, for all I know they're at Compiègne by now. The Boche was over the canal this morning, and by this time, most likely, he's across the Somme. At that I exclaimed, Do you mean to tell me we're going to lose Perron? Perron, he cried, we'll be lucky not to lose Amiens. And on top of it all, I've got some kind of blasted fever. I'll be raving in an hour. He was rushing off, but I held him. What about my old lot? I asked. Oh, damn good, but they're all shot to bits. Every division did well. It's a marvel they weren't all scuppered, and it'll be a flaming miracle if they find a line they can stand on. Westward has got a leg smashed. He was brought down this evening, and you'll find him in the hospital. Fraser's killed, and Lefroy's a prisoner. At least that was my last news. I don't know who's got the brigades, but Masterson's carrying on with the division. You'd better get up the line as fast as you can and take over from him. See the army commander. He'll be in Amiens tomorrow morning for a pow-wow. Laidlaw laid wearily back in his car and disappeared into the night while I hurried to the train. The others had descended to the platform and were grouped around Archie, who was discoursing optimistic nonsense. I got them into the carriage and shut the door. It's pretty bad, I said. The front's pierced in several places and we're back to the upper Somme. I'm afraid it isn't going to stop there. I'm off up the line as soon as I can get my orders. Wake, you'll come with me, for every man will be wanted. Blenkiron, you'll see Mary and Peter safe to England. We're just in time, for tomorrow it mightn't be easy to get out of Amiens. I can see yet the anxious faces in that ill-lit compartment. We said good-bye after the British style, without much to do. I remember that old Peter gripped my hand, as if he would never release it, and that Mary's face had grown very pale. If I delayed another second I should have howled, for Mary's lips were trembling, and Peter had eyes like a wounded stag. "'God bless you,' I said hoarsely, and as I went off I heard Peter's voice, a little cracked, saying, "'God bless you, my old friend.' I spent some weary hours looking for Westwater. He was not in the big clearing station, but I ran him to earth at last in the new hospital which had just got going in the Ursuline convent. He was the most sterling little man, in ordinary life rather dry, and dogmatic, with a trick of taking you up sharply, which didn't make him popular. Now he was lying very stiff and quiet in the hospital bed, and his blue eyes were solemn and pathetic, like a sick dog's. "'There's nothing much wrong with me,' he said, in reply to my question. A shell dropped beside me and damaged my foot. They say they'll have to cut it off. "'I've an easier mind now you're here, Hannay. Of course you'll take over from Masterton. He's a good man, but not quite up to his job. Poor Fraser. You've heard about Fraser. He was done in at the very start. Yes, a shell. And Lefroy. If he's alive and not too badly smashed, the Hun has got a troublesome prisoner. He was too sick to talk, but he wouldn't let me go. The division was all right. Don't you believe anyone who says we didn't fight like heroes? Our outpost line held up the Hun for six hours and only about a dozen men came back. We could have stuck it out in the battle zone if both flanks hadn't been turned. They got through Crab's left, and came down the Vurey ravine, and a big wave rushed Shropshire Wood. 
We fought it out yard by yard and didn't budge till we saw the Plessy dump blazing in our rear. Then it was about time to go. We haven't many battalion commanders left. Watson, Endicott, Crawshay. He stammered out a list of gallant fellows who had gone. Get back double quick, Hannay. They want you. I'm not happy about Masterton. He's too young for the job. And then a nurse drove me out, and I left him speaking in the strange forced voice of great weakness. At the foot of the staircase stood Mary. I saw you go in, she said, so I waited for you. Oh, my dear, I cried, you should have been in Boulogne by now. What madness brought you here? They know me here, and they've taken me on. You couldn't expect me to stay behind. You said yourself everybody was wanted, and I'm in a service like you. Please don't be angry, Dick. I wasn't angry. I wasn't even extra anxious. The whole thing seemed to have been planned by fate since the creation of the world. The game we had engaged in wasn't finished, and it was right that we should play it out together. With that feeling came a conviction, too, of ultimate victory. Somehow or sometime we should get to the end of our pilgrimage. But I remembered Mary's forebodings about the sacrifice required. The best of us. That ruled me out. But what about her? I caught her to my arms. Good-bye, my very dearest. Don't worry about me, for mine's a soft job, and I can look after my skin. But, oh, take care of yourself, for you are all the world to me. She kissed me gravely like a wise child. I am not afraid for you, she said. You are going to stand in the breach, and I know, I know you will win. Remember that there is someone here whose heart is so full of pride of her man that it hasn't room for fear. As I went out of the convent door, I felt that once again I had been given my orders. It did not surprise me that, when I sought out my room on an upper floor of the Hôtel de France, I found Blenkiron in the corridor. He was in the best of spirits. "'You can't keep me out of the show, Dick,' he said, "'so you needn't start arguing. Why, this is the one original chance of a lifetime for John S. Blenkiron. Our little fight at Erzurum was only a sideshow, but this is a real high-class Armageddon. I guess I'll find a way to make myself useful." I had no doubt he would, and I was glad he had stayed behind. But I felt it was hard on Peter to have the job of returning to England alone at such a time, like useless flotsam washed up by a flood. "'You needn't worry,' said Blenkiron. "'Peter's not making England this trip. To the best of my knowledge he has beat it out of this township by the eastern postern. He had some talk with Sir Archibald Roylance, and presently other gentlemen of the Royal Flying Corps appeared, and the upshot was that Sir Archibald hitched on to Peter's grip and departed without saying farewell. My notion is that he's gone to have a few words with his old friends at some flying station, or he might have the idea of going back to England by aeroplane, and so having one last flutter before he folds his wings. Anyhow, Peter looked a mighty happy man. The last I saw he was smoking his pipe with a batch of young lads in a flying corps wagon, and heading straight for Germany. CHAPTER Twenty One: HOW AN EXILE RETURNED TO HIS OWN PEOPLE Next morning I found the army commander on his way to Doulon. "'Take over the division,' he said. "'Certainly. I'm afraid there isn't much left of it. I'll tell Carr to get through to the corps headquarters when he can find them. You'll have to nurse the remnants, for they can't be pulled out yet, not for a day or two. Bless me, Hannay, there are parts of our line which we're holding with a man and a boy. You've got to stick it out till the French take over. We're not hanging on by our eyelids. It's our eyelashes now. What about positions to fall back on, sir? I asked. We're doing our best, but we haven't enough men to prepare them. He plucked open a map. There we're digging a line, and there. If we can hold that bit for two days, we shall have a fair line resting on the river, but we mayn't have time. Then I told him about Blenkiron, whom, of course, he had heard of. He was one of the biggest engineers in the States, and he's got a nailing fine eye for country. He'll make good somehow if you let him help in the job. The very fellow, he said, and he wrote an order. Take this to Jack's, and he'll fix up a temporary commission. Your man can find a uniform somewhere in Amiens. After that I went to the detail camp, and found that Ivory had duly arrived. The prisoner has given no trouble, sir. Hamilton reported, but he's a wee thing peevish. They're saying that the Germans is getting on fine, and I was telling him that he should be proud of his ain folk. But he wasn't very weel pleased. 
Three days had wrought a transformation in ivory. That face, once so cool and capable, was now sharpened like a hunted beast's. His imagination was preying on him, and I could picture its torture. He, who had been always at the top directing the machine, was now only a cog in it. He had never in his life been anything but powerful. Now he was impotent. He was in a hard, unfamiliar world, in the grip of something which he feared and didn't understand, in the charge of men who were in no way amenable to his persuasiveness. It was like a proud and bullying manager suddenly forced to labour in a squad of navvies, and worse, for there was the gnawing physical fear of what was coming. He made an appeal to me. "'Do the English torture their prisoners?' he asked. "'You have beaten me. I own it, and I plead for mercy. I will go on my knees if you like. I am not afraid of death, in my own way. Few people are afraid of death, in their own way. Why do you degrade me? I am a gentleman. Not as we define the thing, I said. His jaw dropped. What are you going to do with me? He quavered. You have been a soldier, I said. You are going to see a little fighting from the ranks. There will be no brutality. You will be armed if you want to defend yourself. You will have the same chance of survival as the men around you. You may have heard that your countrymen are doing well. It is even possible that they may win the battle. What was your forecast to me? Amiens in two days, Abbeville in three? Well, you are a little behind scheduled time, but still you are prospering. You told me that you were the chief architect of all this, and you are going to be given the chance of seeing it, perhaps of sharing in it, from the other side. Does it not appeal to your sense of justice? He groaned and turned away. I had no more pity for him than I would have had for a black mamba that had killed my friend and was now caught to a cleft tree. Nor, oddly enough, had Wake. If we had shot Ivory outright at San Anton, I am certain that Wake would have called us murderers. Now he was in complete agreement. His passionate hatred of war made him rejoice that a chief contriver of war should be made to share in its terrors. He tried to talk me over this morning, he told me, claimed he was on my side, and said the kind of thing I used to say last year. It made me rather ashamed of some of my past performances to hear that scoundrel imitating them. By the way, Hannay, what are you going to do with me? You're coming on my staff. You're a stout fellow, and I can't do without you. Remember, I won't fight. You won't be asked to. We're trying to stem the tide which wants to roll to the sea. You know how the Boche behaves in occupied country, and Mary's in Amiens. At that news he shut his lips. Still, he began. Still, I said, I don't ask you to forfeit one of your blessed principles. You needn't fire a shot, but I want a man to carry orders for me, for we haven't a line any more, only a lot of blobs like Quicksilver. I want a clever man for the job and a brave one, and I know that you're not afraid. No, he said, I don't think I am, much. Well, I'm content. I started Blenkiron off in a car for corps headquarters, and in the afternoon took the road myself. I knew every inch of the country, the lift of the hill east of Amiens, the Roman highway that ran straight as an arrow to Saint-Quentin, the marshy lagoons of the Somme, and that broad strip of land wasted by battle between Dompierre and Peronne. I had come to Amiens through it in January, for I had been up to the line before I left for Paris, and then it had been a peaceful place with peasants tilling their fields, and new buildings going up on the old battlefield, and carpenters busy at cottage roofs, and scarcely a transport wagon on the road to remind one of war. Now the main route was choked like the Albert Road, when the Somme battle first began, troops going up and troops coming down, the latter in the last stage of weariness, a ceaseless traffic of ambulances one way, and ammunition wagons the other, busy staff cars trying to worm a way through the mass, strings of gun horses, oddments of cavalry, and here and there blue French uniforms. All that I had seen before, but one thing was new to me. Little country carts with sad-faced women and mystified children in them, and piles of household plenishing were creeping westward, who stood waiting at village doors. Beside these tramped old men and boys, mostly in their Sunday best, as if they were going to church. I had never seen the sight before, for I had never seen the British army falling back. The dam which held up the waters had broken, and the dwellers in the valley were trying to save their pitiful little treasures. 
and over everything, horse and man, cart and wheelbarrow, road and tillage, lay the white March dust. The sky was as blue as June, small birds were busy in the copses, and in the corners of abandoned gardens I had a glimpse of the first violets. Presently, as we topped a rise, we came within full noise of the guns. That, too, was new to me, for it was no ordinary bombardment. There was a special quality in the sound, something ragged, straggling, intermittent, which I had never heard before. It was the sign of open warfare and a moving battle. At Peronne, from which the newly returned inhabitants had a second time fled, the battle seemed to be at the doors. There I had news of my division. It was farther south, towards saint Christ. We groped our way among bad roads to where its headquarters were believed to be, while the voice of the guns grew louder. They turned out to be those of another division, which was busy getting ready to cross the river. Then the dark fell, and while airplanes flew west into the sunset, there was a redder sunset in the east, where the unceasing flashes of gunfire were pale against the angry glow of burning dumps. The sight of the bonnet-badge of a Scots fusilier made me halt, and the man turned out to belong to my division. Half an hour later I was taking over from the much-relieved Masterton, in the ruins of what had once been a sugar-beet factory. There, to my surprise, I found Lefroy. The Bosch had held him prisoner for precisely eight hours. During that time he had been so interested in watching the way the enemy handled an attack that he had forgotten the miseries of his position. He described with blasphemous admiration the endless wheel by which supplies and reserve troops move up, the silence, the smoothness, the perfect discipline. Then he realized that he was a captive and unwounded, and had gone mad. Being a heavyweight boxer of note, he had sent his two guards spinning into a ditch, dodged the ensuing shots, and found shelter in the lee of a blazing ammunition dump where his pursuers hesitated to follow. Then he had spent an anxious hour trying to get through an outpost line, which he thought was Bosch. Only by overhearing an exchange of oaths in the accents of Dundee did he realize that it was our own. It was a comfort to have Lefroy back, for he was both stout-hearted and resourceful. But I found that I had a division only on paper. It was about the strength of a brigade, the brigade's battalions, and the battalion's companies. This is not the place to write the story of the week that followed. I could not write it even if I wanted to, for I don't know it. There was a plan somewhere, which you will find in the history books, but with me it was blank chaos. Orders came, but long before they arrived the situation had changed, and I could no more obey them than fly to the moon. Often I had lost touch with the divisions on both flanks. Intelligence arrived erratically out of the void, and for the most part we worried along without it. I heard we were under the French. First it was said to be Foch, and then Fayol, whom I had met in Paris. But the higher command seemed a million miles away, and we were left to use our mother wits. My problem was to give ground as slowly as possible, and at the same time not to delay too long, for retreat we must, with the Bosch sending in brand new divisions each morning. It was a kind of war worlds distant from the old trench battles, and since I had been taught no other, I had to invent rules as I went along. Looking back, it seems a miracle that any of us came out of it. Only the grace of God and the uncommon toughness of the British soldier bluffed the Hun and prevented him pouring through the breach to Abbeville and the sea. We were no better than a mosquito curtain stuck in a doorway to stop the advance of an angry bull. The army commander was right. We were hanging on with our eyelashes. We must have been easily the weakest part of the whole front, for we were holding a line which was never less than two miles, and was often, as I judge, nearer five, and there was nothing in reserve to us except some oddments of cavalry who chased about the whole battlefield under vague orders. Mercifully for us the Bosch blundered. Perhaps he did not know our condition, for our airmen were magnificent, and you never saw a Bosch plane over our line by day, though they bombed us merrily by night. If he had called our bluff we should have been done, but he put his main strength to the north and the south of us. North he pressed hard on the Third Army, but he got well hammered by the guards north of Bapaume, and he could make no headway at Arras. South he drove at the Paris Railway, and down the Oise Valley, but there Pétain's reserves had arrived, and the French made a noble stand. 
Not that he didn't fight hard in the centre where we were, but he hadn't his best troops, and after we got west of the bend of the Somme he was outrunning his heavy guns. Still, it was a desperate enough business, for our flanks were all the time falling back, and we had to conform to movements we could only guess at. After all, we were on the direct route to Amiens, and it was up to us to yield slowly so as to give Haig and Pétain time to get up supports. I was a miser about every yard of ground, for every yard and every minute were precious. We alone stood between the enemy and the city, and in the city was Mary. If you ask me about our plans, I can't tell you. I had a new one every hour. I got instructions from the Corps, but as I have said, they were usually out of date before they arrived, and most of my tactics I had to invent myself. I had a plain task, and to fulfil it I had to use what methods the Almighty allowed me. I hardly slept, I ate little, I was on the move day and night, but I never felt so strong in my life. It seemed as if I couldn't tire, and oddly enough I was happy. If a man's whole being is focused on one aim, he has no time to worry. I remember we were all very gentle and soft-spoken those days. Lefroy, whose tongue was famous for its edge, now cooed like a dove. The troops were on their uppers, but as steady as rocks. We were against the end of the world, and that stiffens a man. Day after day saw the same performance. I held my wavering front with an outpost line which delayed each new attack till I could take its bearings. I had special companies for counter-attack at selected points, when I wanted time to retire the rest of the division. I think we must have fought more than a dozen of such little battles. We lost men all the time, but the enemy made no big scoop, though he was always on the edge of one. Looking back, it seems like a succession of miracles. Often I was in one end of a village when the Bosch was in the other. Our batteries were always on the move, and the work of the gunners was past praising. Sometimes we faced east, sometimes north, and once at a most critical moment due south, for our front waved and blew like a flag at a masthead. Thank God the enemy was getting away from his big engine, and his ordinary troops were fagged and poor in quality. It was when his fresh shock battalions came on that I held my breath. He had a heathenish amount of machine-guns, and he used them beautifully. Oh, I take my hat off to the Bosch performance. He was doing what we had tried to do at the Somme and the Aisne, and Arras and Ypres, and he was more or less succeeding, and the reason was that he was going bald-headed for victory. The men, as I have said, were wonderfully steady, and patient under the fiercest trials that soldiers can endure. I had all kinds in the division, old army, new army, territorials, and you couldn't pick and choose between them. They fought like Trojans, and dirty, weary, and hungry, found still some salt of humour in their sufferings. It was a proof of the rock-bottom sanity of human nature, but we had one man with us who was hardly sane. In the hustle of those days I now and then caught sight of Ivory. I had to be everywhere at all hours, and often visited that remnant of Scots fusiliers into which the subtlest brain in Europe had been drafted. He and his keepers were never on outpost duty or in any counter-attack. They were part of the mass whose only business was to retire discreetly. This was child's play to Hamilton, who had been out since Mons, and Amos, after taking a day to get used to it, wrapped himself in his grim philosophy and rather enjoyed it. You couldn't surprise Amos any more than a Turk. But the man with them, whom they never left, that was another matter. For the first wee bit, Hamilton reported, we thought he was gone daft. Every shell that came near he jumped like a young horse. And the gas we had to tie on his mask for him, for his hands were fushionless. There was wiles that he wasn't to be hindered from standing up and talking to himself, though the bullets was spitten. He was what you call demoralized. Sign he got as though he didn't hear or see anything. He did what we tell him, and when we let him be, he sat down and grat. He's eye greeting. Queer thing, sir but the Germans canna hit him. I'm I shaking bullets out of my clays, and I got a hole in my shoulder, and Andrew took a bash on his tin that would have felled anybody that hadn't a head like a stot. But, sir, the prisoner tacks no scase. Our boys have feared of him. There was an Irishman says to me that he had the evil eye, and ye can see for yourself that he's no canny. I saw that his skin had become like parchment, and that his eyes were glassy. I don't think he recognized me. "'Does he take his meals?' I asked. 
He doesn't eat muckle, but he has an unco thirst. You canna keep him off the men's water bottles. He was learning very fast the meaning of that war he had so confidently played with. I believe I am a merciful man, but as I looked at him I felt no vestige of pity. He was dreeing the weird he had prepared for others. I thought of Scudder, of the thousand friends I had lost, of the great seas of blood and the mountains of sorrow this man and his like had made for the world. Out of the corner of my eye I could see the long ridges above Comble and Longueval, which the salt of the earth had fallen to win, and which were again under the hoof of the Bosch. I thought of the distracted city behind us, and what it meant to me, and the weak, the pitifully weak screen, which was all its defence. I thought of the foul deeds which had made the German name to stink by land and sea, foulness of which he was the arch-begetter. And then I was amazed at our forbearance. He would go mad, and madness for him was more decent than sanity. I had another man who wasn't what you might call normal, and that was Wake. He was the opposite of shell-shocked, if you understand me. He had never been properly under fire before, but he didn't give a straw for it. I had known the same thing with other men, and they generally ended by crumpling up, for it isn't natural that five or six feet of human flesh shouldn't be afraid of what can torture and destroy it. The natural thing is to be always a little scared, like me, but by an effort of the will and attention to work to contrive to forget it. But Wake apparently never gave it a thought. He wasn't foolhardy, only indifferent. He used to go about with a smile on his face, a smile of contentment. Even the horrors, and we had plenty of them, didn't affect him. His eyes, which used to be hot, had now a curious open innocence like Peter's. I would have been happier if he had been a little rattled. One night, after we had had a bad day of anxiety, I talked to him as we smoked in what had once been a French dugout. He was an extra right arm to me, and I told him so. "'This must be a queer experience for you,' I said. "'Yes,' he replied. "'It is very wonderful. I did not think a man could go through it and keep his reason. But I know many things I did not know before. I know that the soul can be reborn without leaving the body.' I stared at him, and he went on without looking at me. "'You're not a classical scholar, Hannay. There was a strange cult in the ancient world, the worship of Magna Mater, the Great Mother. To enter into her mysteries the votary passed through a bath of blood. I think I am passing through that bath. I think that, like the initiate, I shall be Renatus in Aeternum, reborn into the Eternal. I advised him to have a drink, for that talk frightened me. It looked as if he were becoming what the Scots call fay. Lefroy noticed the same thing, and was always speaking about it. He was as brave as a bull himself, and with very much the same kind of courage, but Wake's gallantry perturbed him. "'I can't make the chap out,' he told me. He behaves as if his mind was too full of better things to give a damn for Bosch guns. He doesn't take foolish risks, I don't mean that, but he behaves as if risks didn't signify. It's positively eerie to see him making notes with a steady hand when shells are dropping like hailstones and we're all thinking every minute's our last. You've got to be careful with him, sir. He's a long sight too valuable for us to spare." Lefroy was right about that, for I don't know what I should have done without him. The worst part of our job was to keep touch with our flanks, and that was what I used Wake for. He covered country like a moss trooper, sometimes on a rusty bicycle, oftener on foot, and you couldn't tire him. I wonder what other divisions thought of the grimy private, who was our chief means of communication. He knew nothing of military affairs before, but he got the hang of this rough-and-tumble fighting as if he had been born for it. He never fired a shot, he carried no arms, the only weapons he used were his brains, and they were the best conceivable. I never met a staff officer who was so quick at getting a point or at sizing up a situation. He had put his back into the business, and first-class talent is not common anywhere. One day a GSO from a neighbouring division came to see me. "'Where on earth did you pick up that man Wake?' he asked. "'He's a conscientious objector and a non-combatant,' I said. "'Then I wish to heaven we had a few more conscientious objectors in this show. He's the only fellow who seems to know anything about this blessed battle. My general's sending you a chit about him.' 
No need, I said laughing. I know his value. He's an old friend of mine. I used Wake as my link with Corps headquarters, and especially with Blenkiron, for about the sixth day of the show I was beginning to get rather desperate. This kind of thing couldn't go on for ever. We were miles back now, behind the old line of seventeen, and, as we rested one flank on the river, the immediate situation was a little easier. But I had lost a lot of men, and those that were left were blind with fatigue. The big bulges of the enemy to north and south had added to the length of the total front, and I found I had to fan out my thin ranks. The Bosch was still pressing on, though his impetus was slacker. If he knew how little there was to stop him in my section, he might make a push which would carry him to Amiens. Only the magnificent work of our airmen had prevented him from getting that knowledge, but we couldn't keep the secrecy up for ever. Some day an enemy plane would get over, and it only needed the drive of a fresh storm battalion or two to scatter us. I wanted a good prepared position, with sound trenches and decent wiring. Above all, I wanted reserves. Reserves! The word was on my lips all day, and it haunted my dreams. I was told that the French were to relieve us, but when, when? My reports to Corps headquarters were one long wail for more troops. I knew there was a position prepared behind us, but I needed men to hold it. Wake brought in a message from Blenkiron. "'We're waiting for you, Dick,' he wrote, "'and we've gotten quite a nice little home ready for you. The old man hasn't hustled so hard since he struck copper in Montana in '92. We've dug three lines of trenches and made a heap of pretty redoubts, and I guess they're well laid out, for the Army staff has supervised them, and there are no slouches at this brand of engineering. You would have laughed to see the labor we employed. We had all breeds of Dago and Chinamen, and some of your own South African blacks, and they got so busy on the job they forgot about bedtime. I used to be reckoned a bit of a slave-driver, but my special talents weren't needed with this push. I'm going to put a lot of money into foreign missions henceforward." I wrote back, "'Your trenches are no good without men. For God's sake get something that can hold a rifle. My lot had done to the world.' Then I left Lefroy with the division, and went down on the back of an ambulance to see for myself. I found Blenkiron, some of the army engineers, and a staff officer from Corps headquarters, and I found Archie Roylance. They had dug a mighty good line and wired it nobly. It ran from the river to the wood of La Bruyere, on the little hill above the Ablin stream. It was desperately long, but I saw at once it couldn't well be shorter, for the division on the south of us had its hands full with the fringe of the big thrust against the French. "'It's no good blinking the facts,' I told them. "'I haven't a thousand men, and what I have are at the end of their tether. If you put them in these trenches, they'll go to sleep on their feet. When can the French take over?" I was told that it had been arranged for next morning, but that it had now been put off twenty-four hours. It was only a temporary measure, pending the arrival of British divisions from the north. Archie looked grave. "'The Bosch is pushing up new troops in this sector. We got the news before I left squadron headquarters. It looks as if it would be a near thing, sir." "'It won't be a near thing. It's an absolute black certainty. My fellows can't carry on as they are another day. Great God, they've had a fortnight in hell. Find me more men, and we buckle up at the next push." My temper was coming very near its limits. "'We've raked the country with a small-tooth comb, sir,' said one of the staff officers, "'and we've raised a scratch pack, best part of two thousand. Good men, but most of them know nothing about infantry fighting. We've put them into platoons, and done our best to give them some kind of training. There's one thing may cheer you. We've plenty of machine-guns. There's a machine-gun school nearby, and we got all the men who were taking the course and all the plant." I don't suppose there was ever such a force put into the field before. It was a wilder medley than Mouchy's camp followers at first Ypres. There was every kind of detail in the shape of men returning from leave, representing most of the regiments in the army. There were the men from the machine-gun school. There were corps troops, sappers, and A.S.C., and a handful of corps cavalry. Above all, there was a batch of American engineers, fathered by Blenkiron. I inspected them where they were drilling and liked the look of them. Forty-eight hours, I said to myself, with luck we may just pull it off. 
Then I borrowed a bicycle and went back to the division. But before I left I had a word with Archie. This is one big game of bluff, and it's you fellows alone that enable us to play it. Tell your people that everything depends on them. They mustn't stint the planes in this sector, for if the Bosch once suspicions how little he's got before him, the game's up. He's not a fool, and he knows that this is the shortest road to Amiens, but he imagines we're holding it in strength. If we keep up the fiction for another two days, the thing's done. You say he's pushing up troops? Yes, and he's sending forward his tanks. Well, that'll take time. He's slower now than a week ago, and he's got a deuce of a country to march over. There's still an outside chance we may win through. You go home and tell the RFC what I've told you. He nodded. By the way, sir, Pienaar's with the squadron. He would like to come up and see you. Archie, I said solemnly, be a good chap and do me a favor. If I think Peter's anywhere near the line, I'll go off my head with worry. This is no place for a man with a bad leg. He should have been in England days ago. Can't you get him off to Amiens anyhow? We scarcely like to. You see, we're all desperately sorry for him, his fun gone and his career over and all that. He likes being with us and listening to our yarns. He has been up once or twice, too. The shark Gladys. He swears it's a great make, and certainly he knows how to handle the little devil. Then for heaven's sake, don't let him do it again. I look to you, Archie. Remember. Promise. Funny thing, but he's always worrying about you. He has a map on which he marks every day the changes in position, and he'd hobble a mile to pump any of our fellows who've been up your way. That night, under cover of darkness, I drew back the division to the newly prepared lines. We got away easily, for the enemy was busy with his own affairs. I suspected a relief by fresh troops. There was no time to lose, and I can tell you, I toiled to get things straight before dawn. I would have liked to send my own fellows back to rest, but I couldn't spare them yet. I wanted them to stiffen the fresh lot, for they were veterans. The new position was arranged on the same principles as the old front, which had been broken on March 21st. There was our forward zone, consisting of an outpost line and redoubts, very cleverly sighted with a line of resistance. Well behind it were the trenches which formed the battle zone. Both zones were heavily wired, and we had plenty of machine guns. I wish I could say we had plenty of men who knew how to use them. The outposts were merely to give the alarm and fall back to the line of resistance, which was to hold out to the last. In the forward zone I put the freshest of my own men, the units being brought up to something like strength by the details returning from leave that the Corps had commandeered. With them I put the American engineers, partly in the redoubts and partly in companies for counter-attack. Blenkiron had reported that they could shoot like Dan'l Boone and were simply spoiling for a fight. The rest of the force was in the battle zone, which was our last hope. If that went, the Bosch had a clear walk to Amiens. Some additional field batteries had been brought up to support our very weak divisional artillery. The front was so long that I had to put all three of my emaciated brigades at the line, so I had nothing to speak of in reserve. It was a most almighty gamble. We had found shelter just in time. At six-thirty next day, for a change it was a clear morning with clouds beginning to bank up from the west, the Bosch let us know he was alive. He gave us a good drenching with gas shells, which didn't do much harm, and then messed up our forward zone with his trench mortars. At seven-twenty his men began to come on, first little bunches with machine guns, and then the infantry in waves. It was clear they were fresh troops, and we learned afterwards from prisoners that they were Bavarians, sixth or seventh, I forget which, but the division that hung us up at Monchy. At the same time there was the sound of a tremendous bombardment across the river. It looked as if the main battle had swung from Albert and Montdidier to a direct push for Amiens. I have often tried to write down the events of that day. I tried it in my report to the Corps, I tried it in my own diary, I tried it because Mary wanted it, but I have never been able to make any story that hung together. Perhaps I was too tired for my mind to retain clear impressions, though at the time I was not conscious of special fatigue. More likely it is because the fight itself was so confused, for nothing happened according to the books, and the orderly soul of the Bosch must have been scarified. At first it went as I expected. 
The outpost line was pushed in, but the fire from the redoubts broke up the advance and enabled the line of resistance in the forward zone to give a good account of itself. There was a check, and then another big wave, assisted by a barrage from field guns brought far forward. This time the line of resistance gave at several points, and Lefroy flung in the Americans in a counter-attack. That was a mighty performance. The engineers, yelling like dervishes, went at it with a bayonet, and those that preferred swung their rifles as clubs. It was terribly costly fighting, and all wrong, but it succeeded. They cleared the Bosch out of a ruined farm he had rushed, and a little wood, and we established our front. Blenkiron, who saw it all, for he went with them and got the tip of an ear picked off by a machine-gun bullet, hadn't any words wherewith to speak of it. And I once said those boys looked puffy, he moaned. The next phase, which came about midday, was the tanks. I had never seen the German variety, but had heard that it was speedier and heavier than ours, but unwieldy. We did not see much of their speed, but we found out all about their clumsiness. Had the things been properly handled, they should have gone through us like rotten wood. But the whole outfit was bungled. It looked good enough country for the use of them, but the men who made our positions had had an eye to this possibility. The great monsters, mounting a field gun besides other contrivances, wanted something like a high road to be happy in. They were useless over anything like difficult ground. The ones that came down the main road got on well enough at the start, but Blenkiron very sensibly had mined the highway, and we blew a hole like a diamond pit. One lay helpless at the foot of it, and we took the crew prisoner. Another stuck its nose over, and remained there till our field guns got the range, and knocked it silly. As for the rest, there is a marshy lagoon called the Pâte d'Oie beside the farm of Gavrel, which runs all the way north to the river, though in most places it only seems like a soft patch in the meadows. This the tanks had to cross to reach our line, and they never made it. Most got bogged and made pretty targets for our gunners. One or two returned, and one, the Americans, creeping forward under cover of a little stream, blew up with a time fuse. By the middle of the afternoon I was feeling happier. I knew the big attack was still to come, but I had my forward zone intact, and I hoped for the best. I remember I was talking to Wake, who had been going between the two zones, when I got the first warning of a new and unexpected peril. A dud shell plumped down a few yards from me. "'Those fools across the river are firing short and badly off the strait,' I said. Wake examined the shell. "'No, it's a German one,' he said. Then came others, and there could be no mistake about the direction, followed by a burst of machine-gun fire from the same quarter. We ran in cover to a point from which we could see the north bank of the river, and I got my glass on it. There was a lift of land from behind which the fire was coming. We looked at each other, and the same conviction stood in both faces. The Bosch had pushed down the northern bank, and we were no longer in line with our neighbours. The enemy was in a situation to catch us with his fire on our flank and left rear. We couldn't retire to conform, for to retire meant giving up our prepared position. It was the last straw to all our anxieties, and for a moment I was at the end of my wits. I turned to wake, and his calm eyes pulled me together. "'If they can't retake that ground, we're fairly carted,' I said. "'We are. Therefore they must retake it. I must get on to Mitchinson.' But as I spoke, I realized the futility of a telephone message to a man who was pretty hard up against it himself. Only an urgent appeal could affect anything. I must go myself. No, that was impossible. I must send Lefroy, but he couldn't be spared. And all my staff officers were up to their necks in the battle. Besides, none of them knew the position as I knew it. And how to get there? It was a long way round by the bridge at Loisy. Suddenly I was aware of Wake's voice. "'You had better send me,' he was saying. "'There's only one way to swim the river a little lower down.' "'That's too damnably dangerous. I won't send any man to certain death.' "'But I volunteer,' he said. "'That, I believe, is always allowed in war.' "'But you'll be killed before you can cross.' "'Send a man with me to watch. If I get over, you may be sure I'll get to General Mitchinson. If not, send somebody else by Loisy. There's desperate need for hurry, and you see yourself it's the only way." The time was past for argument. I scribbled a line to Mitchinson as his credentials. No more was needed, for Wake knew the possession as well as I did. 
I sent an orderly to accompany him to a starting place on the bank. "'Good-bye,' he said, as we shook hands. "'You'll see. I'll come back all right.' His face, I remember, looked singularly happy. Five minutes later the Bosch guns opened for the final attack. I believe I kept a cool head, at least so Lefroy and the others reported. They said I went about all afternoon grinning as if I liked it, and that I never raised my voice once. It's rather a fault of mine that I bellow in a scrap. But I know I was feeling anything but calm, for the problem was ghastly. It all depended on Wake and Mitchinson. The flanking fire was so bad that I had to give up the left of the forward zone, which caught it fairly, and retire the men there to the battle zone. The latter was better protected, for between it and the river was a small wood, and the bank rose into a bluff which sloped inwards towards us. This withdrawal meant a switch, and a switch isn't a pretty thing when it has to be improvised in the middle of a battle. The Bosch had counted on that flanking fire. His plan was to break our two wings, the old Bosch plan which crops up in every fight. He left our centre at first pretty well alone, and thrust along the river bank and to the wood of La Bruyere, where we linked up with the division on our right. Lefroy was in the first area, and Masterton in the second, and for three hours it was as desperate a business as I have ever faced. The improvised switch went, and more and more of the forward zone disappeared. It was a hot, clear spring afternoon, and in the open fighting the enemy came on like troops at manoeuvres. On the left they got into the battle zone, and I can see yet Lefroy's great figure leading a counter-attack in person, his face all puddled with blood from a scalp wound. I would have given my soul to be in two places at once, but I had to risk our left and keep close to Masterton, who needed me most. The wood of La Bruyere was the maddest sight. Again and again the Boche was almost through it. You never knew where he was, and most of the fighting there was duels between machine-gun parties. Some of the enemy got around behind us, and only a fine performance of a company of Cheshires saved a complete breakthrough. As for Lefroy, I don't know how he stuck it out, and he doesn't know himself he was galled all the time by that accursed flanking fire. I got a note about half-past four, saying that Wake had crossed the river, but it was some weary hours after that before the fire slackened. I tore back and forward between my wings, and every time I went north I expected to find that Lefroy had broken. But by some miracle he held. The Boche were in his battle zone time and time again, but he always flung them out. I have a recollection of Blenkiron, stark mad, encouraging his Americans with strange tongues. Once as I passed him I saw that he had his left arm tied up. His blackened face grinned at me. This bit of landscape's mighty unsafe for democracy, he croaked. For the love of Mike, get your guns onto those devils across the river. They're plaguing my boys too bad. It was about seven o'clock, I think, when the flanking fire slacked off, but it was not because of our divisional guns. There was a short and very furious burst of artillery fire on the north bank, and I knew it was British. Then things began to happen. One of our planes, they had been marvels all day, swinging down like hawks for machine-gun bouts with the Bosch infantry, reported that Mitchinson was attacking hard and getting on well. That eased my mind, and I started off for Masterton, who was in greater straits than ever, for the enemy seemed to be weakening on the river bank and putting his main strength in against our right. But my GSO, too, stopped me on the road. Wake, he said, he wants to see you. Not now, I cried. He can't live many minutes. I turned and followed him to the ruinous cowshed, which was my divisional headquarters. Wake, as I heard later, had swum the river opposite the Mitchinson's right, and reached the other shore safely, though the current was whipped with bullets. But he had scarcely landed before he was badly hit by shrapnel in the groin. Walking at first with support, and then carried on a stretcher, he managed to struggle on to the divisional headquarters, where he gave my message and explained the situation. He would not let his wound be looked to till his job was done. Mitchinson told me afterwards that with a face grey from pain he drew for him a sketch of our position and told him exactly how near we were to our end. After that he asked to be sent back to me, and they got him down to Loisy in a crowded ambulance, and then up to us in a returning empty. 
The M.O. who looked at his wound saw that the thing was hopeless, and did not expect him to live beyond Loisy. He was bleeding internally, and no surgeon on earth could have saved him. When he reached us he was almost pulseless, but he recovered for a moment and asked for me. I found him, with blue lips and a face drained of blood, lying on my camp bed. His voice was very small and far away. "'How goes it?' he asked. "'Please God, we'll pull through, thanks to you, old man.' "'Good,' he said, and his eyes shut. He opened them again. "'Funny thing, life. A year ago I was preaching peace. I'm still preaching it. I'm not sorry.' I held his hand till two minutes later he died. In the press of a fight one scarcely realizes death, even the death of a friend. It was up to me to make good my assurance to wake, and presently I was off to Masterton. There, in that shambles of La Bruyere, while the light faded, there was a desperate and most bloody struggle. It was the last lap of the contest. Twelve hours now, I kept telling myself, and the French will be here and will have done our task. Alas, how many of us would go back to rest! Hardly able to totter, our counter-attacking companies went in again. They had gone far beyond the limits of mortal endurance, but the human spirit can defy all natural laws. The balance trembled, hung, and then dropped the right way. The enemy impetus weakened, stopped, and the ebb began. I wanted to complete the job. Our artillery put up a sharp barrage, and the little I had left comparatively fresh I sent in for a counter-stroke. Most of the men were untrained, but there was that in our ranks which dispensed with training, and we had caught the enemy at the moment of lowest vitality. We pushed him out of La Bruyere, we pushed him back to our old forward zone, we pushed him out of that zone to the position from which he had begun the day. But there was no rest for the weary. We had lost at least a third of our strength, and we had to man the same long line. We consolidated it as best we could started to replace the wiring that had been destroyed, found touch with the division on our right, and established outposts. Then after a conference with my brigadiers I went back to my headquarters, too tired to feel either satisfaction or anxiety. In eight hours the French would be here. The words made a kind of litany in my ears. In the cowshed where Wake had lain, two figures awaited me. The talc-enclosed candle revealed Hamilton and Amos, dirty beyond words, smoke-black and blood-stained, and intricately bandaged. They stood stiffly to attention. "'Sir, the prisoner,' said Hamilton, "'I have to report that the prisoner is dead.' I stared at them, for I had forgotten Ivory. He seemed a creature of a world that had passed away. "'Sir, it was like this. Ever since this morning the prisoner seemed to wake up. You'll mind that he was in a kind of a dream all week.' but he got some new notions in his haid, and when the battle began he exhibited signs of restlessness, whilst he would lie down in the trench, and whilst he was wanted back to the dugout. According to instructions I provided him with a rifle, but he didn't seem to ken how to handle it. It was your orders, sir, that he was to have means to defend himself if the enemy came on, so Amos gave him a trench knife. But very soon he looked as if he was Etlin to cut his throat, so I deprived him of it. Hamilton stopped for breath. He spoke as if he were reciting a lesson, with no stops between the sentences. "'I jealous, sir, that he wouldna last oot the day, and Amos here was of the same opinion. The end came at twenty minutes past three. I ken the time, for I had just compared my watch with Amos. You'll mind that the Germans were beginning a big attack. We were in the front trench of what they call the battle zone, and Amos and me was keeping our eyes on the enemy, who could be observed dribbling over the open.' Just then the prisoner catches sight of the enemy, and jumps up on top. Amos tried to hold him, but he kicked him in the face. The next weekend he was running very fast towards the enemy, holding his hands over his head, and crying out loud in a foreign language. It was German, said the scholarly Amos, through his broken teeth. It was German, continued Hamilton. It seemed as if he was appealing to the enemy to help him. But they paid no attention, and he came under fire of their machine-guns. We watched him spin round like a teetotum, and kenned that he was by with it. "'You were sure he was killed?' I asked. "'Yes, sir. When we counter-attacked, we found his body.' There is a grave, close by the farm of Gavrel, and a wooden cross at its head bears the name 
of the Graf von Schwabing and the date of his death. The Germans took Gavrel a little later. I am glad to think that they read that inscription. Chapter 22 The Summons Comes for Mr. Standfast I slept for one and three-quarters hours that night, and when I awoke I seemed to emerge from deeps of slumber which had lasted for days. That happened sometimes after heavy fatigue and great mental strain. Even a short sleep sets up a barrier between past and present, which has to be elaborately broken down before you can link on with what has happened before. As my wits groped at the job, some drops of rain splashed on my face through the broken roof. That hurried me out of doors. It was just after dawn, and the sky was piled with thick clouds, while a wet wind blew up from the southwest. The long prayed-for break in the weather seemed to have come at last. A deluge of rain was what I wanted, something to soak the earth and turn the roads into watercourses and clog the enemy transport, something above all to blind the enemy's eyes. For I remembered what a preposterous bluff it all had been, and what a piteous broken handful stood between the Germans and their goal. If they knew, if they only knew, they would brush us aside like flies. As I shaved, I looked back on the events of yesterday as on something that had happened long ago. I seemed to judge them impersonally, and I concluded that it had been a pretty good fight. A scratch force, half of it dog-tired, and half of it untrained, had held up at least a couple of fresh divisions. But we couldn't do it again, and there were still some hours before us of desperate peril. When had the Corps said that the French would arrive? I was on the point of shouting for Hamilton to get Wake to rig up Corps headquarters, when I remembered that Wake was dead. I had liked him, and greatly admired him, but the recollection gave me scarcely a pang. We were all dying, and he had only gone on a stage ahead. There was no morning strafe, such as had been our usual fortune in the past week. I went out of doors, and found a noiseless world under the lowering sky. The rain had stopped falling, the wind of dawn had lessened, and I feared that the storm would be delayed. I wanted it at once to help us through the next hours of tension. Was it in six hours that the French were coming? No, it must be four. It couldn't be more than four, unless somebody had made an infernal muddle. I wondered why everything was so quiet. It would be breakfast time on both sides, but there seemed no stir of man's presence in that ugly strip half a mile off. Only far back in the German hinterland I seemed to hear the rumour of traffic. An unslept and unshaven figure stood beside me, which revealed itself as Archie Roylance. "'Been up all night,' he said cheerfully, lighting a cigarette. "'No, I haven't had breakfast. The skipper thought we'd better get another anti-aircraft battery up this way, and I was superintendent of the job. He's afraid of the Hun getting over your lines and spying out the nakedness of the land for you know we're uncommon naked, sir. Also, and Archie's face became grave, the Hun's pourin' divisions down on this sector. As I judge, he's blowin' up for a thunderin' big drive on both sides of the river. Our lads yesterday said all the country back of Peronne was lousy with new troops, and he's getting his big guns forward, too. You haven't been troubled with them yet, but he has got the roads mended, and a devil of a lot of new light railways, and any moment we'll have the five-point nine saying good morning. Pray heaven you get relieved in time, sir. I take it there's not much risk of another push this morning. I don't think so. The Boche took a nasty knock yesterday, and he must fancy we're pretty strong after that counter-attack. I don't think he'll strike till he can work both sides of the river, and that'll take time to prepare. That's what his fresh divisions are for. But remember, he can attack now if he likes. If he knew how weak we were, he's strong enough to send us all to glory in the next three hours. It's just that knowledge that you fellows have got to prevent his getting. If a single Hun plane crosses our lines and returns, we're wholly and utterly done. You've given us splendid help since the show began, Archie. For God's sake, keep it up to the finish, and put every machine you can spare in the sector. We're doing our best, he said. We got some more fightin' scouts down from the north and we're keepin' our eyes skinned. But you know as well as I do, sir, that it's never an absolute certainty. If the Hun sent over a squadron, we might beat em all down but one, and that one might do the trick. It's a matter of luck. The Hun's got the wind up all right in the air just now, and I don't blame the poor devil. 
I'm inclined to think that we haven't had the pick of his push here. Jennings says he's doing good work in Flanders, and they reckon there's a deuce of a thrust coming there pretty soon. I think we can manage the kind of footler he's been sending over here lately, but if Lynch or some lad like that were to choose to turn up, I wouldn't say what might happen. The air's a big lottery, and Archie turned a dirty face skyward, where two of our planes were moving very high towards the east. The mention of Lynch brought Peter to mind, and I asked if he had gone back. "'He won't go,' said Archie, "'and we haven't the heart to make him. He's very happy, and he plays about with the Gladys single-seater. He's always speaking about you, sir, and it'd break his heart if we shifted him.' I asked about his health, and was told that he didn't seem to have much pain. "'But he's a bit queer,' and Archie shook his sage head. One of the reasons why he won't budge is because he says God has some work for him to do. He's quite serious about it, and ever since he got the notion he has perked up a mason. He's always asking about Lynch, too. Not vindictive, like you understand, but quite friendly. Seems to take a sort of proprietary interest in him. I told him that Lynch had had a far longer spell of first-class fightin' than anybody else, and was bound by the law of averages to be down soon, and he was quite sad about it. I had no time to worry about Peter. Archie and I swallowed breakfast, and I had a pow-wow with my brigadiers. By this time I had got through to Corps headquarters, and got news of the French. It was worse than I expected. General Peggy would arrive about ten o'clock, but his men couldn't take over till well after midday. The Corps gave me their whereabouts, and I found it on the map. They had a long way to cover yet, and then there would be the slow business of relieving. I looked at my watch. There were still six hours before us, when the Boche might knock us to blazes, six hours of maddening anxiety. Lefroy announced that all was quiet on the front, and that the new wiring at the Bois de la Bruyere had been completed. Patrols had reported that, during the night, a fresh German division seemed to have relieved that which we had punished so stoutly yesterday. I asked him if he could stick it out against another attack. No, he said without hesitation. We're too few and too shaky on our pins to stand any more. I've only a man to every three yards. That impressed me, for Lefroy was usually the most devil-may-care optimist. Curse it! There's the sun! I heard Archie cry. It was true, for the clouds were rolling back, and the centre of the heavens was a patch of blue. The storm was coming, I could smell it in the air, but probably it wouldn't break till the evening. Where, I wondered, would we be by that time? It was now nine o'clock, and I was keeping tight hold on myself, for I saw that I was going to have hell for the next hours. I am a pretty stolid fellow in some ways, but I have always found patience and standing still the most difficult job to tackle, and my nerves were all tattered from the long strain of the retreat. I went up to the line and saw the battalion commanders. Everything was unwholesomely quiet there. Then I came back to my headquarters to study the reports that were coming in from the air patrols. They all said the same thing, abnormal activity in the German back areas. Things seemed shaping for a new 21st of March, and if our luck were out, my poor little remnant would have to take the shock. I telephoned to the Corps and found them as nervous as me. I gave them the details of my strength and heard an agonized whistle at the other end of the line. I was rather glad that I had companions in the same purgatory. I found I couldn't sit still. If there had been any work to do, I would have buried myself in it, but there was none, only this fearsome job of waiting. I hardly ever feel cold, but now my blood seemed to be getting thin, and I astonished my staff by putting on a British warm and buttoning up the collar. Round that derelict farm I ranged like a hungry wolf, cold at the feet, queasy in the stomach, and mortally edgy in the mind. Then suddenly the cloud lifted from me, and the blood seemed to run naturally in my veins. I experienced the change of mood which man feels sometimes, when his whole being is fined down and clarified by long endurance. The fight of yesterday revealed itself as something rather splendid. What risks we had run, and how gallantly we had met them! My heart warmed as I thought of that old division of mine, those ragged veterans that were never beaten as long as breath was left in them, and the Americans, and the boys from the machine-gun school, and all the oddments we had commandeered, and old Blenkiron raging like a good-tempered lion. 
It was against reason that such fortitude shouldn't win out. We had snarled round and bitten the Boche so badly that he wanted no more for a little. He would come again, but presently we should be relieved, and the gallant blue-coats, fresh as paint and burning for revenge, would be there to worry him. I had no new facts on which to base my optimism, only a changed point of view, and with it came a recollection of other things. Wake's death had left me numb before, but now the thought of it gave me a sharp pang. He was the first of our little confederacy to go, but what an ending he had made, and how happy he had been in that mad time when he had come down from his pedestal and become one of the crowd. He had found himself at last, and who could grudge him such happiness? If the best were to be taken, he would be chosen first, for he was a big man before whom I uncovered my head. The thought of him made me very humble. I had never had his troubles to face, but he had come clean through them, and reached a courage which was for ever beyond me. He was the faithful among us pilgrims, who had finished his journey before the rest. Mary had foreseen it. There is a price to be paid, she had said, the best of us. And at the thought of Mary a flight of warm and happy hopes seemed to settle on my mind. I was looking again beyond the war to that peace which she and I would some day inherit. I had a vision of a green English landscape, with its far-flung sense of wood and meadow and garden, and that face of all my dreams, with the eyes so childlike and brave and honest, as if they too saw beyond the dark to a radiant country. A line of an old song, which had been a favourite of my father's, sang itself in my ears. There's an eye that ever weeps, and a fair face will be fain, when I ride through Annan water with my bonny bands again. We were standing by the crumbling rails of what had once been the farm sheepfold. I looked at Archie, and he smiled back at me, for he saw that my face had changed. Then he turned his eyes to the billowing clouds. I felt my arm clutched. Look there, said a fierce voice, and his glasses were turned upward. I looked, and far up in the sky saw a thing like a wedge of wild geese flying towards us from the enemy's country. I made out the small dots which composed it, and my glass told me that they were planes. But only Archie's practised eye knew that they were enemy. Bosch, I asked. Bosch, she said. My God, we're for it now. My heart had sunk like a stone, but I was fairly cool. I looked at my watch and saw that it was ten minutes to eleven. How many? Five, said Archie, or there may be six, not more. Listen, I said, get on to your headquarters. Tell them that it's all up with us if a single plane gets back. Let them get well over the line, the deeper in the better, and tell them to send up every machine they possess and down them all. Tell them it's life or death. Not one single plane goes back. Quick! Archie disappeared, and as he went our anti-aircraft guns broke out. The formation above opened and zigzagged, but they were too high to be in much danger. But they were not too high to see that which we must keep hidden or perish. The roar of our batteries died down as the invaders passed westward. As I watched their progress they seemed to be dropping lower. Then they rose again, and a bank of cloud concealed them. I had a horrid certainty that they must beat us, that some at any rate would get back. They had seen thin lines in the roads behind us, empty of supports. They would see, as they advanced, the blue columns of the French coming up from the southwest, and they would return and tell the enemy that a blow now would open the road to Amiens and the sea. He had plenty of strength for it, and presently he would have overwhelming strength. It only needed a spear-point to burst the jerry-built dam and let the flood through. They would return in twenty minutes, and by noon we would be broken unless, unless the miracle of miracles happened, and they never returned. Archie reported that his skipper would do his damnedest, and that our machines were now going up. We've a chance, sir, he said, a good sportin' chance. It was a new Archie, with a hard voice, a lean face, and very old eyes. Behind the jagged walls of the farm buildings was a knoll, which had once formed part of the high road. I went up there alone, for I didn't want anybody near me. I wanted a viewpoint, and I wanted quiet, for I had a grim time before me. From that knoll I had a big prospect of country. I looked east to our lines, on which an occasional shell was falling, and where I could hear the chatter of machine-guns. 
West there was peace for the woods closed down on the landscape. Up to the north, I remember, there was a big glare as from a burning dump, and heavy guns seemed to be at work in the Ancre Valley. Down in the south there was the dull murmur of a great battle, but just around me in the gap, the deadliest place of all, there was an odd quiet. I could pick out clearly the different sounds. Somebody down at the farm had made a joke, and there was a short burst of laughter. I envied the humorist his composure. There was a clatter and jingle from a battery changing position. On the road a tractor was jolting along. I could hear its driver shout, and the screech of its unoiled axle. My eyes were glued to my glasses, but they shook in my hands so that I could scarcely see. I bit my lip to steady myself, but they still wavered. From time to time I glanced at my watch. Eight minutes gone, ten, seventeen. If only the planes would come into sight. Even the certainty of failure would be better than this harrowing doubt. They should be back by now unless they had swung north across the salient, or unless the miracle of miracles. Then came the distant yapping of an anti-aircraft gun, caught up the next second by others, while smoke patches studded the distant blue sky. The clouds were banking in mid-heaven, but to the west there was a big clear space now woolly with shrapnel bursts. I counted them mechanically, one, three, five, nine, with despair beginning to take the place of my anxiety. My hands were steady now, and through the glasses I saw the enemy. Five attenuated shapes rode high above the bombardment, now sharp against the blue, now lost in a film of vapour. They were coming back, serenely, contemptuously, having seen all they wanted. The quiet was gone now, and the din was monstrous. Anti-aircraft guns, singly and in groups, were firing from every side. As I watched, it seemed a futile waste of ammunition. The enemy didn't give a tinker's curse for it. But surely there was one down. I could only count four now. No, there was the fifth coming out of a cloud. In ten minutes they would be all over the line. I fairly stamped in my vexation. Those guns were no more use than a sick headache. Oh, where in God's name were our own planes? At that moment they came, streaking down into sight, four fighting scouts with the sun glinting on their wings and burnishing their metal cowls. I saw clearly the rings of red, white, and blue. Before their downward drive, the enemy instantly spread out. I was watching with bare eyes now, and I wanted companionship, for the time of waiting was over. Automatically I must have run down the knoll, for the next I knew I was staring at the heavens with Archie by my side. The combatants seemed to couple instinctively. Diving, wheeling, climbing, a pair would drop out of the melee or disappear behind a cloud. Even at that height I could hear the methodical rat-tat-tat of the machine-guns. Then there was a sudden flare and wisp of smoke. A plane sank, turning and twisting to earth. Hun, said Archie, who had his glasses on it. Almost immediately another followed. This time the pilot recovered himself while still a thousand feet from the ground, and started gliding for the enemy lines. Then he wavered, plunged sickeningly, and fell headlong into the wood behind La Bruyere. Farther east, almost over the front trenches, a two-seater albatross and a British pilot were having a desperate tussle. The bombardment had stopped, and from where we stood every movement could be followed. First one, then another, climbed uppermost and dived back swooped out and wheeled in again, so that the two planes seemed to clear each other only by inches. Then it looked as if they closed and interlocked. I expected to see both go crashing, when suddenly the wings of one seemed to shrivel up, and the machine dropped like a stone. Hun, said Archie, that makes three. Oh, good lads, good lads! Then I saw something which took away my breath. Sloping down in wide circles came a German machine, and following, a little behind and a little above, a British. It was the first surrender in mid-air I had seen. In my amazement I watched the couple right down to the ground, till the enemy landed in a big meadow across the high road, and our own man in a field nearer the river. When I looked back into the sky, it was bare. North, south, east, and west, there was not a sign of aircraft, British or German. A violent trembling took me. Archie was sweeping the heavens with his glasses, and muttering to himself, Where was the fifth man? He must have fought his way through, and it was too late. But
But was it? From the toe of a great rolling cloud-bank a flame shot earthwards, followed by a V-shaped trail of smoke. British or Bosch, British or Bosch, I didn't wait long for an answer, for riding over the far end of the cloud came two of our fighting scouts. I tried to be cool and snapped my glasses into their case, though the reaction made me want to shout. Archie turned to me with a nervous smile and a quivering mouth. I think we have won on the post, he said. He reached out a hand for mine, his eyes still on the sky, and I was grasping it when it was torn away. He was staring upwards with a white face. We were looking at the sixth enemy plane. It had been behind the others and much lower, and was making straight at great speed for the east. The glasses showed me a different type of machine, a big machine with short wings, which looked menacing as a hawk in a covey of grouse. It was under the cloud-bank, and above, satisfied, easing down after their fight, and unwitting of this enemy, rode the two British craft. A neighbouring anti-aircraft gun broke out into a sudden burst, and I thanked heaven for its inspiration. Curious as to this new development, the two British turned, caught sight of the Bosch, and dived for him. What happened in the next minutes I cannot tell. The three seemed to be mixed up in a dog-fight, so that I could not distinguish friend from foe. My hands no longer trembled, I was too desperate. The patter of machine-guns came down to us, and then one of the three broke clear and began to climb. The others strained to follow, but in a second he had risen beyond their fire, for he had easily the pace of them. Was it the Hun? Archie's dry lips were talking. It's Lynch, he said. How do you know? I gasped angrily. Can't mistake him. Look at the way he slipped out as he banked. That's his patent trick. In that agonizing moment hope died in me. I was perfectly calm now, for the time for anxiety had gone. Farther and farther drifted the British pilots behind, while Lynch, in the completeness of his triumph, looped more than once as if to cry an insulting farewell. In less than three minutes he would be safe inside his own lines, and he carried the knowledge which for us was death. Someone was bawling in my ear and pointing upward. It was Archie, and his face was wild. I looked and gasped, seized my glasses and looked again. A second before, Lynch had been alone. Now there were two machines. I heard Archie's voice. My God, it's the Gladys, the little Gladys. His fingers were digging into my arm, and his face was against my shoulder. And then his excitement sobered into an awe which choked his speech, as he stammered, It's, it's old. But I did not need him to tell me the name, for I had divined it when I first saw the new plane drop from the clouds. I had that queer sense that comes sometimes to a man, that a friend is present when he cannot see him. Somewhere up in the void two heroes were fighting their last battle, and one of them had a crippled leg. I had never any doubt about the result, though Archie told me later that he went crazy with suspense. Lynch was not aware of his opponent till he was almost upon him, and I wonder if by any freak of instinct he recognized his greatest antagonist. He never fired a shot nor did Peter. I saw the German twist and side-slip, as if to baffle the fate descending upon him. I saw Peter veer over vertically, and I knew that the end had come. He was there to make certain the victory, and he took the only way. The machines closed, there was a crash which I felt, though I could not hear it, and the next second both were hurtling down, over and over, to the earth. They fell in the river just short of the enemy lines, but I did not see them, for my eyes were blinded, and I was on my knees. After that it was all a dream. I found myself being embraced by a French general of division, and saw the first companies of the cheerful bluecoats whom I had longed for. With them came the rain, and it was under a weeping April sky that early in the night I marched what was left of my division away from the battlefield. The enemy guns were starting to speak behind us, but I did not heed them. I knew that now there were warders at the gate, and I believed that by the grace of God that gate was barred for ever. They took Peter from the wreckage, with scarcely a scar except his twisted leg. Death had smoothed out some of the age in him, and left his face much as I remembered it long ago in the Mashonaland hills. In his pocket was his old battered pilgrim's progress. 
It lies before me as I write, and beside it, for I was his only legatee, the little case which came to him weeks later, containing the highest honour that can be bestowed upon a soldier of Britain. It was from the Pilgrim's Progress that I read next morning, when, in the lee of an apple orchard, Mary and Blenkiron and I stood, in the soft spring rain beside his grave. And what I read was the tale in the end, not of Mr. Standfast, whom he had singled out for his counterpart, but of Mr. Valiant for truth, whom he had not hoped to emulate. I set down the words as a salute and a farewell. Then said he, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I am got hither, yet now I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me, to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles, who now will be my rewarder. So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side.